enjoy reading in your spare time. Okay, so we've got the vast majority. And I bet that you have a particular genre that you like to read, right? Um, if you were to look at the bookshelves in the Lewis household, you would find it to be an odd amalgamation. But one of the things that I absolutely adore reading is biographies. And particularly, biographies about someone who has come from a very humble beginning and really made something of their life. Um, the, the ones that come to mind, which I have the most volumes of, are people like presidents, um, musicians, all of which come from this mishmash often of poverty. And then the one biography that I probably would not pick up is if somebody actually did a lengthy biography of Solomon. He doesn't come from abject circumstances. He comes from a royal house, probably with the lingering stories whispered for time immemorial about how his mother and father came into relationship with one another. Now, David dies, and because of the chronology that we see in first we can surmise that Solomon was probably 15 or 16 when he takes the throne. So he's a young guy. And he had everything. This is the apex of Jewish history. It is at this time that the temple is going to be constructed. And because David was a man of war, Solomon, whose name actually means man of war, will be the one who will construct this incredible edifice. Solomon then prays and offers sacrifice. And he asks one thing. He realizes this is a daunting task. And he says that he needs wisdom. If you look at the letter of James in the New Testament, chapter 1, verse 5, you will find that there is a promise given to God's people. If you pray for wisdom, God will grant it freely. But how many of us actually pray for wisdom? Or do we confuse what wisdom really is? Oftentimes we forget that wisdom is not knowledge. I've known a number of people who are college dropouts or high school dropouts who were incredibly wise, but they may not necessarily have a lot of knowledge. They knew how to apply it, however. For Solomon, one of the great mistakes that happens in his life is all of this wisdom eventually goes to his head. And I can't tell you how many times I've been with people who have had terrific moral failings, and all of a sudden they realize, well, I didn't know that I would ever live into so-and-so's life. They thought of themselves as larger than life. We live in a very self-absorbed culture, too. So applying our hearts to wisdom, as the psalmist tells us, is the beginning of having really, truly wise life. Asking God, for the wisdom that can only come from him. Conversely, what happens if we don't apply our hearts to wisdom or we ignore wisdom? The narcissism. Solomon really liked himself. All of the wives and concubines and horses and gold which he was told not to gather, he does in a gets pretty comfortable. And narcissism often leads to idolatry where we worship the big letter I. Have you not all known people like that who really were self-worshippers? 
What if the church embraced wisdom? And I say that with a great sense of a kind of a face palm moment this week when I hear the news that's coming out of Pennsylvania about our brothers and sisters in the Roman church. How in the world that they could be so blind to cover up things as we've known they happen for a very long time. My great grandmother used to keep a diary. And in that diary, she grew up in a tiny little town of Troy, Maine. And there was a kind of picturesque kind of place. It had a stream that went through the middle of town. And there were some mills that used that, that stream as a source of power. And there was a convent. Problem was, one particular in, well, 1907, the stream went dry. And suddenly people didn't have power to work at the mills, and they discovered to their horror that in the back of this convent was the covered up skeletons of babies. Because life was not what people thought it was. People were not dealing with wisdom. People were dealing with the depravity of human nature. And instead of acknowledging it and repenting, they covered it up. You see, all of life has the possibility of a water gate for us if we don't apply our hearts to wisdom. So what if the church embraced wisdom? We get three things out of this. Perspective. You ever know somebody who's really wise and they have the ability to see the long length of history and not get their nose out of joint about the tiny little things which OCD people like you and I often do. I'm just like, not you and I, but definitely me. I get bent out of whack about little stuff and I have to remind myself that that's not wise. I get my blood pressure up. I get upset over things I don't need to. It's a passive thing. What about our hearts? Our hearts not changed by wisdom when we begin to see things not in an arrangement of events, but in view of real people who matter and for whom Christ died. Or what about integrating, this is another form of wisdom, integrating knowledge that one acquires with real life circumstances. One of the things that you do when you're in seminary in the middle of your senior year is you take these ridiculous tests called general ordination exams. And you would think that they would test knowledge. After all, you get in the master's degree program. It doesn't. It's really testing your wisdom, whether or not you have the capacity to run a parish, but you've never done that before. So it's testing something you've never had the ability to apply. But that comes pretty quick. Because once you're out in the real world and things that seminary or whatever you all have prepared your life for, when you're out in the real world, you find out that you pretty quickly have to be wise, not just learned. Sometimes people who are learned may be smart, but useless in the real world. God's wisdom is often silly to us. And when we pray for wisdom, be prepared that it may not necessarily make sense. Kind of like when God wants to redeem the entire world, it starts in the little, tiny, tiny little Bethlehem to a 14 or 15 year old girl who is not of noble birth. And the whole thing doesn't make any sense. Or, or pulling his son out of the grave after the third day and the first people who witness it aren't even admissible witnesses in court. But that's God's wisdom. God created an entire redemptive act for us, which we are participating in this morning. And his wisdom often looks to us to be foolish. But it's perfect. And it's perfectly made for you. So let's apply, as a church, our hearts to wisdom. Let's apply them, recognizing that God's wisdom, which we 
participating in one, this is him, two, makes us better, and three, changes lives for good. And perhaps in the midst of a world that is so incredibly corrupt and where people, even people in the church, continually fail, let us acknowledge before one another when we fail and then support, this is realism, support one another to live holy lives, truly able to look one another and see that although we be sinners, God still lives and dwells.